everyone. It's Dr. Shannon from the Abrams Planetarium back again with another video uh, on the night sky and what we can look forward to. So today we are going to be talking about the summer solstice and the summer constellations that we can see right now in early summer and to midsummer. We're going to take a look at a few of the animal constellations uh, to fit with the library's theme this summer. And we are going to also take a look at some of the planets and some exciting things that you can uh, go outside and kind of watch for over the next uh, several weeks. So we are going to be using Stellarium from Stellarium.org again, if you've seen any of these videos in the past. And if not, this is a really great free software. You can download it and it works for Windows, Macs, and Linux machines. And it's again, completely free. There is also a web-based version that is free, or there is a phone app that you can download for a few dollars uh, for the full version. All of them are really wonderful. You can change the date, the time, and the location, so you can see exactly what you would expect to see for a given uh, time when you go outside. But let's go ahead and get started. So the summer solstice is on June 20th this year. And so this marks our longest day of the year and the day that the sun gets the highest. So I have a set to just before the sun rises on June 20th of this year in Stellarium. You can see the date right down here and our time is about 5.36 in the morning. You can see the sun is just, the light is just starting to peak above the horizon. We don't quite see the sun yet. So let's go ahead and watch the sun as it moves across the sky on the solstice. So as the earth moves around the sun, because we are tilted in the summertime, the northern hemisphere, in our summertime, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, which means we get more direct sunlight and more of our, as we rotate around the earth, more of that's tilted into the sunlight, giving us the longer days. So let's go ahead and speed time up just a little bit here. We'll watch the sun as it rises here. I'm gonna go a little bit slower to begin with just so that we can see exactly where the sun is rising. You can see it's rising in the eastern side of the sky, but it's not rising exactly east. So here it is just coming above the horizon, sort of almost to northeast. So in the summertime, the sun does rise in the northeast. And as it moves across the sky, let's speed up just a little bit more here. We'll follow it. It has a much larger arc than it does in, say, the winter time. And that gives us a much longer day. So we started at about 5.30 in the morning. Here it is. It gets pretty high. I'm going to stop it right when it's south real quick. We are almost there, so right around here. It gets up pretty high in the sky, but it does not go directly overhead. This is the highest the sun will ever get for us in the Lansing area. So if we kind of pull back a little bit, whoop, there we go, we get south right here. Zenith, or the point directly overhead, would be sort of right in the middle of the circle. You can see it gets close, but it's not perfect. So it only gets to about 75 degrees or so. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, so we fixed that. Uh, so it, it gets pretty high. It gets to about uh, 75 degrees or so in the Lansing area, um, up in the sky, but it does not get to Zenith. The only places where it would get to Zenith or directly overhead are places that are within 23 and a half degrees of the Earth's equator. So you have to be near the equator to ever see that. So here we go. We can watch it as it starts to set. And we can see the sun is going to set towards the northwest. And as it continues to settle, there we go. And here we are at sunset at about 9.30, almost 10 o'clock. Uh, and so, so you can see that we have a very long day. We went from about 5.30 to about 9.30. So a very long set of daylight, which is nice. It brings us warmer weather. It means that we have less time with the sky and the nighttime, but 
it is going to be warmer when we go outside, which makes it a much more pleasant condition to go outside and look at our stars. So we have about 15 hours of daylight or so uh, on, the per on the summer solstice, and that is our longest day. After this, the days will start to get shorter again. So one of the first things that I want to take a look at is as the sun sets, one of the first things you might notice is behind a tree there, we have uh, Venus and Mars. So you can see that it's pretty low in the sky, so things like trees and buildings might block the view. But if you can get a clear view, I'm going to go ahead and switch our uh, landscape so we can see something just a little bit easier here. There we go. So that gives us a better view, a clearer view of the sort of west to northwest here we will see Venus and Mars. So Venus is a planet that's closer to the sun uh, than we are. So we're always looking towards the direction of the sun to see it. So we always see it either right in the west, right as the sun is setting, or in the east, right when the sun is rising. So right now we have Venus right here. Um, it's in the evening sky right now. And here is Mars. Mars is not nearly as bright as Venus, so it's going to be a little bit harder to see in the in sort of the twilight here, but you might be able to get a view of it. The reason why I wanted to point these out is they are heading towards a conjunction on set, or, sorry, July 13th. So they'll be about a half a degree apart. And for reference, the moon in our sky looks to be about a half a degree wide. Um, when it's a full moon. And so they'll be about a moon's width apart in the sky when they hit their conjunction on July 13th. So if you do have a clear view, um, keep an eye out for Venus and Mars over uh, the next several weeks, um, next month or so, and you'll see Venus and Mars get closer and closer and closer. Let's actually take a quick look at that. If we skip a day ahead, a day by day, we can watch them sort of close in on each other there. And so Venus and Mars, here we are on the 13th. You can see on here, they look almost like they're on top of each other. That's an effect of uh, Stellarium and making the brighter objects look a little bit bigger. When we get a little bit closer, you can see there is some separation between them, but it's they are very, very close. So do keep an eye on that. That's going to be a nice treat this summer is the conjunction of Venus and Mars. It does happen pretty frequently every couple of years. So if you miss this one or you, you get um, the weather's not great, don't worry, there'll be other opportunities to see that. So that's uh, the first thing I want to show you, but let's go ahead and speed time up until it is very nice and dark here. So as the sun continues to set below the horizon, it'll start to get dark. We will see Venus and then Mars shortly after sink below the horizon as well. And so let's sort of zoom out. If you just saw something moving, that was a satellite, a man-made satellite. So we're going to go to about... A little bit later. I want all of our summer constellations up. So we're going to take a look at all of our summer all of our summer constellations. They should be um, up right about now and a few of the animal constellations. We will be doing another program that will involve a lot more animal constellations throughout the entire year. But right now we're going to focus on what's up right now. So we're at about 11 p.m. a little bit after Venus is now below the horizon. Mars is very close to it. So let's take a look at our constellations that we have here in the south. So these are our seasonal constellations. Now we are in the early summer here. We are literally the first day of summer officially on the summer solstice. So we do still see our spring constellations, uh, a few of them that are easy to spot. Uh, they will continue to set earlier and earlier as we go through the summer. Uh, and we will also uh, see them shift westward more and more. So over here in the west, one of the first things that we uh, might see right here is this sort of backwards question mark or a sickle shape with a triangle behind it. This is Leo the lion. So let's go ahead and outline Leo here. Here's Leo's art so we can see our lovely lion. Uh, and again, I think we will save the whole story of Leo for another time uh, for when we talk more about the animal constellations, but that is one of the animals you can go check out. Uh, another great one, if you have trouble finding Leo, by the way, if you can spot the Big Dipper, here's the Big Dipper in our Northwest. 
you can use the outer two stars of the Big Dipper and follow it downwards and it will point right to Leo for you. You can also use the handle of the Big Dipper right here to use the arc to arc to Arcturus. So Arcturus is here and it's part of Boote's uh, which is a herdsman. So he takes care of animals. He's not an animal himself, but he takes care of animals. Uh, and this is another one of our spring constellations that you can keep an eye out for. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about that in another video. So let's go take a look at those summer constellations. So they are just really starting to show up right now. Um, one of the first ones to look for and it will be a little bit easier to spot later on in the summer, but it's this sort of curly Q shape here with a bright reddish star. So this bright red star, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that, is named Antares. So it's A-N-T as in anti, same root, and Aries as in the Greek name for Mars. So a lot of our planet names are Roman, are the Roman gods, and so Aries is the Greek counterpart to Mars. So this translates to the rival of Mars, or not Mars sometimes. And Mars does pass by Antares um, on occasion, and they are both sort of similarly red and similarly bright. And so it's important to know that this one is not Mars, and Mars is Mars. So there you go. You know, you know that star is not Mars. Uh, but... This might look a bit like a fishing hook, and so in Polynesian astronomy, this is known as Maui's hook. So this is a fishing hook in Polynesian astronomy. If you've seen the movie Moana, this constellation is featured prominently in the sky during the wayfinding scenes on the ocean. It's going to appear much higher in the sky than it does for us in mid-Michigan because at lower latitudes, closer to the equator, the sky in the south is shifted up higher. And so it is in the correct placement uh, for uh, the Polynesian islands. Uh, so do check that out um, if you uh, haven't noticed it before. And then right over here, oh wait, the official name for this though, the one that astronomers use that originates from Greek mythology is an animal. It is a bug. So see if you pop, anything pops into your head. But this is Scorpius. You might have got it from here as well. Scorpius the scorpion. And no, I say Scorpius. So Scorpio is the zodiac sign, but the constellation is actually called Scorpius. Uh, and so that's one thing to point out. So this is our scorpion. So this is the curly tail of the scorpion. So in early summer, this one is such a low constellation. It never gets really high above the horizon. It will come fully above the horizon later on in the summer, but it skirts the horizon for the summer. It's, it's really quite a low constellation. And the story that goes with this that comes from Greek mythology actually relates to Orion, which is one of our winter constellations. And so there's a lot of different versions of Greek mythology. And so one of the versions of Orion's story is that he boasted that he could, he was such a good hunter that he could kill all the animals on a given island or all the animals in the world. He was boasting that he could kill all the animals. And this did not make uh, the gods happy because they could, were concerned about the ecosystem just as like we are today. We need to have balance. We can't kill all the animals because that's a problem for the entire ecosystem and maintaining balance for everyone's food and the food chain and so on. And so they sent uh, a scorpion to go attack Orion. Um, and the scorpion went and killed Orion and chased him, chased him around and killed him. And so uh, the, again, different versions um, of the story, different uh, people have loved Orion. So the person who loved Orion was very upset by this and asked that he be placed in the sky to honor him. Uh, and so the Orion and the scorpion were placed in the sky, but on opposite sides. So we see Orion in the wintertime and we see the scorpion in the summertime. So they are never together in the sky at the same time. So that's our story of the scorpion. Um, and if we look over here, it's a little hard to see. One of the stars is hidden behind this building. Another very low uh, 
uh, summer constellation is something that we like to call the teapot. So you can kind of see this right here. We have a little teapot lid and a little triangle over here for the spout. And there's our little teapot. Um, we like to call it the teapot because we think this looks a bit like a teapot here, but this is Sagittarius the Archer. And so um, you might notice that over here we have the body of a horse and a human right here. And so this is half horse, half man shooting an arrow towards the scorpion. Uh, and so this is uh, it. it Exactly which centaur this is, they're sort of, again, different stories. Uh, but overall, it, it is believed that this is one of the very first centaurs who was known as someone who did not get along with humans very well and was a very fierce warrior. And speaking of animals, I don't know if you can hear it all, the birds chirping right outside my house. We have some baby robins in our backyard, uh, which has been delightful to watch them grow up, but they're about ready to leave the nest and Mama Robin is getting a little um, territorial right now, so we can hear them quite a bit. All right, so let's look over here in the east. Uh, we have our summer constellations that do get quite high up in the sky. Uh, here and we have the constellations of um, or the three stars here we have Vega, we have Deneb and Altair and these three stars make up the summer triangle and so the summer triangle is uh, one of the first sets of constellations that we really start to see in the summertime so this is something that would be really nice to go outside to try to find um, even earlier in the night over in the east and it stays up uh, for quite a while. We actually see it pretty late into the fall. Um, so this is a, a really nice uh, thing to go outside and see. And the brightest of the three stars is right here. It is called Vega. And Vega, here let's turn our art off for now, uh, is, a, it's, its magnitude is a zero magnitude star. So if we click on the star right here, we can see the magnitude here is listed as zero. And it magnitude is a way of talking about the brightness that a star has in the sky or a brightness an object has in the sky. And the magnitude is the apparent magnitude. So how bright does it look like? How bright does it look to us on Earth? And so this, the way a magnitude system works is the smaller the number, the brighter the object. So Vega is one of our brighter stars. It's not the brightest, but it's one of the brighter stars. Uh, and so it being a zero magnitude star, it's actually used as a calibration star uh, for observing so that we can calibrate all of our instruments when measuring the brightness. Uh, so here we have Vega and it kind of looks like a fish um, or a piece of candy I've heard before as well. There's lots of different ideas. Um, and I don't blame you if you think this looks like a fish, but in Greek mythology, this is a harp. So this is Lyra, the lyre, or Lyra, the harp. So a lyre is a type of harp. So you can see that shape here, um, right there. So this is Vega, the uh, Vega in the constellation Lyra, the harp. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn those off for now. Now, if we go over here to Deneb. I'm going to give you a hint. Deneb comes from the Arabic for tail. So we've talked about this on the uh, previous programs if you've seen them, but again, if you have not, a lot of our star names, some of them are Greek, some of them are Latin, uh, the proper names for the brighter stars that we see naked eye, but a lot of them are also Arabic. And so when Greek sailors would travel to an Arabic speaking port, people would take the scrolls off the ships, copy them so that they could add it to their libraries. And the Greek names were then translated into Arabic. And the Arabic translations are what we end up having as proper names for a lot of the stars that we see. And so Deneb is one of those. So Deneb comes from the Arabic for tail. So that gives you a hint that we have another animal here. So this is the tail right here. And then over here we have another star called Albirio, which marks the beak um, of this. So we've got a tail feather and a beak, and we have very long wings here. So these stars right here, just kind of going to the middle of these wings, marks uh, something that some people like to call this the Northern Cross. So you can find the Northern Cross, but the whole constellation extends out much farther. And so here we have Cygnus 
the swan. So this is the swan with the tail feather and the long beak. So we'll take a look here. And so Deneb is, um, has a magnitude of 1.25. I think it makes it the dimmest of the three stars in the summer triangle, but it is still a pretty nice one to go outside and see. Now, again, Cygnus, the swan, when it comes to stories in Greek mythology, there's a lot of versions of it. And it's unclear which one was the original intention. So one version is that this is a swan that was a pet swan of Queen Cassiopeia. So Cassiopeia is seen right nearby here. She is in the north. It's this W shape right here. So Queen Cassiopeia um, is up every night of the year. At this time of year in the summer, she's low. And then by this the um, fall and winter, she's very, very high up in the sky. So um, this is where we see her right now, though, very low in the sky near the swan. So some versions of her story is that the swan is the, uh, the pet swan of Cassiopeia. Another version of this relates to um, another winter constellation, actually, Gemini. So there's a Greek story of there was a beautiful woman named Leda, uh, and uh, the god Zeus fell in love with her. He fell in love with a lot of people, um, and he tended to fall in love with mortal women, so women who were not gods um, or goddesses. And so he fell in love with Leda. Uh, and in order to seduce her, he turned himself into a swan and went to her. And eventually, Leda laid an egg, and from that egg came two sons, uh, Castor and Pollux, or Polydeuces in, Greeks and, in Greek and Pollux, which are the twins of Gemini. So one was mortal from her husband, and one was immortal. And so a lot of uh, folks, and the most common story associated with Cygnus the swan is that this is the swan that Zeus turned himself into to seduce Leda, um, and that eventually resulted in the birth of the twins of Gemini, which is a winter constellation, um, so we have to wait a little while to see them again. All right, so finally, we have another star here um, that marks the other part of the summer triangle. So we have Vega, we have Deneb, and Altair. And Altair marks the last one here. So if we click on Altair, we see that we have this shape here. Um, oftentimes in planetariums, there's lines drawn here. So I think this looks like a manta ray personally, uh, but this is another bird. Um, so we have another bird up in the summer sky. So we have Aquila, the eagle. And so Aquila is one of those uh, constellations where we, we, we know what, what this one is. So Aquila is the pet eagle of Zeus. And so, and did a lot of sort of errands, if you will, for Zeus. Uh, and there's a couple stories associated with Aquila that uh, people talk about the most. One is, um, relates to Ganymede. So Ganymede, first of all, is the name of a moon around Jupiter. Jupiter being the Roman name for Zeus. Uh, and uh, Ganymede was a young boy. And so, and Zeus decided he wanted Ganymede to be the cupbearer for the gods on Mount Olympus. So Aquila was sent to grab Ganymede and bring him back to the sky. Another constellation that is associated with Ganymede is the constellation of Aquarius. So the water bearer um, that's also associated with Ganymede holding the cup. Uh, and so that's uh, not up right now either, um, but right now we have Aquila who has an association with different uh, stories. Another story of Aquila is a little bit more violent, if you will. Um, so there was a Titan named Prometheus. Prometheus was one of the last Titans who went to war with the Greek gods. And um, he worked with the gods and he was quite friendly with Zeus. Um, but he was also someone who wanted to look out for the humans on Earth. And he saw the humans uh, were struggling and so gave them the gift of fire. Uh, and so the, uh, Zeus didn't like this. He didn't feel that humans deserved the fire. And so he, as a punishment to Prometheus, tied him up and sent Aquila to peck out his eyes. 
Um, so that's not a very nice story about Aquila, um, but there are a few different stories where Aquila shows up in the sky. So these are some of our summer constellations um, here, but you notice that we have kind of a big old gap right here, and that's because there are a few more constellations we can go take a look at. Um, one is if you find this sort of waste basket shape or the keystone shape, one of the stars is a little hard to see, but it's right here in between Lyra and Baotes, the herdsman. And this marks Hercules. Um, and Hercules has a lot of stories associated with him, um, but most notably he was responsible for the 12 labors to, uh, to make up for, um, uh, to atone for some sins that he committed. And so there's a lot of those stories that involve different animals. He had to uh, capture or kill a lion. There was a bull that he had to capture. There were some birds he had to capture, a water snake, and so on. So there's a lot of animals associated with the 12 labors of Hercules. So you can um, go find, there, there's a lot of them, so that you can go find them. And I'm going to share a resource at the end. That's a really great resource. It's one of my favorites just for like a quick check on a lot of the different stories and mythologies associated with different constellations. It's also really useful so, for some other things. So I'm going to share that right at the end uh, so that you can uh, go look up more information on your own. And we have Ophiuchus. So Ophiuchus is sort of a larger constellation right here. And if we click on it, we can see it's kind of a percolator shape. And so here we have a, a man holding a snake right here. And so Ophiuchus is associated with a, a great healer in Greek mythology. And so it, it is the origin of Ophiuchus holding this snake, the serpent holder, that is uh, where we get the medical symbol with the snakes around the staff today. Uh, and one thing I want to note is you can see he's holding a snake, but this is actually not a part of the constellation of Ophiuchus. So he's holding the snake, but the snake itself is actually its own constellation that is split up into two. One is the um, head of the snake and one is the tail. So if we go ahead and click on this, we can actually get the constellation part of the snake that he is holding here. And if we turn on the names, um, you can see it's called Serpens. And so it's its own constellation, but it's also split into the head and the tail. So it's a weird constellation that goes across another constellation, um, but that is one that we have up in the summertime. Now these ones are a little bit fainter and maybe a little bit harder to see, but you can go outside and try to find them. Another fun story about Ophiuchus, um, which is more of a modern story of this. So zodiac constellations, you can see we have some nearby. We have Scorpius, we have Sagittarius, Capricornus is about to rise. We haven't seen that one quite yet. Uh, but these are all, these are our zodiac constellations, Leo over here and so on. Uh, so what makes a zodiac a zodiac constellation? It has to do with how they line up with the solar system. So if you think of the solar system as a flat disk, the constellations that line up with that disk are our zodiac constellations. What that means more specifically is as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, the sun will appear directly in front of those constellations. So it'll pass through the constellation of Scorpius and the constellation of Sagittarius. So uh, here we go. I'm going to turn on these. So these are the boundary lines for constellations. So this is actually how we define constellations um, today, is actually by these boundary lines. It's not just the shapes that we connect in the stars. It's the boundaries around them. And so if we look here, we can actually place the line that the uh, of where the sun is in the sky throughout the year up here. So let's go ahead and do that under markings, gonna, it's called the ecliptic. Nope, not the ecliptic grid, just the ecliptic, there we go. So it's this red line here. So as we go around the sun, the sun appears to move along this line here called the ecliptic. So you can see it passes into Scorpius, it passes into Sagittarius, passes into Leo over here, uh, and 
so on. Virgo, Libra, these are fainter, so we, we haven't talked about them a whole lot. Um, but you see, it also passes into the boundary of Ophiuchus. And so there was a story a few years ago, uh, NASA talked about it on a blog, of the 13th zodiac uh, sign being Ophiuchus, or the 13th zodiac constellation being Ophiuchus. So any constellation that the sun passes through is technically a zodiac constellation. So I wanted to bring that up just because we don't talk about Ophiuchus a whole lot and it has a fun story that we do get asked about every once in a while. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. The other thing that I wanna sort of point out before we end today is we saw Mars and Venus and we saw the very lovely uh, uh, conjunction that they're heading toward. But let's look over here. You might see the word Saturn just starting to pop up. Now, as we move later into the summer, we will see Saturn and Jupiter rise earlier and earlier. Uh, so right now they are both up and fairly easy to see in the constellation of, oh, there's Aquarius. Here's Capricornus, there we go. So they're sort of in Aquarius and Capricornus right here. So there's Ganymede. Um, and Capricornus is a great constellation. We will talk more about that in the next installment because um, there's a really funny animal story there. Um, but we've got Jupiter and Saturn rising. So right now they're rising after midnight. Uh, so if you are outside after midnight, look outside towards the southeast and you will see Jupiter and Saturn. Um, but as we go later into the summer, they will rise earlier and earlier and you'll be able to see them earlier and earlier. So uh, do keep an eye out for Jupiter and Saturn. They just had their great conjunction in December, so they are reversed from where we saw them uh, near each other last summer. Um, so we will not be seeing uh, another conjunction from them for about 20 more years, uh, but you can go outside and see them in the sky, and they are really quite brilliant and nice to go see. So I did also want to share with you this really great resource online. It's called heavens-above.com. So heavensabove.com. And it's a really great resource for a lot of different reasons. So let's go take a, a quick look at it. So first of all, when you come here, uh, the first thing you can do is change your location. So it automatically sets itself to unspecified, but you can go in there and change your location. And once you do that, you can get information such as when the International Space Station or other satellites will be going overhead and exactly where to look for it. Uh, and it will also give you information like you can get a sky chart uh, or information about the sun, moon, and planets for your location. But what I wanted to point out in particular today was the constellations tab here under astronomy. If you click on that, you uh, can it will give you the boundary information, the shape, the names of the stars, and so on. It will uh, give you um, more information about the magnitudes of the stars, their coordinates, and so on. Um, but what I wanted to point out is right here, there's a little button that says a little mythology. So you can also click on that, and it will tell you a little bit of the mythology behind each constellation. Uh, so you can go in and learn some of those stories on your own. So this is one of my favorite resources for a lot of different reasons, including the mythology. It's where I will usually go and double check what the stories were, how many different versions there were, um, and it's a, a really nice sort of starting point uh, if you don't want to go too far in depth. So uh, go check that out, and uh, again, continue to go outside and look up.